Hi, good morning. This is Amr Abdul Gawad from Texas Tech El Paso. We're going to speak today about a very important topic, which is developmental dysplasia of the hip or DDH. What are the objectives of this lecture? The objectives of this lecture is to describe the pathology of DDH. This is number one. Number two, we'd like to identify the risk factor for DDH. And this is very important, as we will see, because it controls how are we going to screen the children for DDH. And then we would like to outline the algorithm for screening uh, uh, kids uh, w for DDH. Uh, also, we'd like to explain the clinical pictures of DDH in different age groups. And we would like to analyze the finding of DDH in both x-rays and ultrasound. And finally, we would like to give a hint on the treatment options for kids with DDH. A good source that you can use to read more about this topic is this book, which is Pediatric Orthopedics, a handbook for primary care physician by myself and Dr. Naga. Let's speak now about the pathology of DDH. The instance is about 1-2%. to 2%. Uh, Please keep in mind that this is the instance of the DDH in general. However, the instance for dislocation, uh, which is um, at the end of this spectrum, is about 1 in 1,000. And the left hip is always more affected than the right hip. And um, this condition may be associated with other congenital anomalies uh, that occur due to tight intrauterine space, like metatarsus adductus, for example. Uh, I'd like to mention here that the DDH is a spectrum of a disease. It can range all the way from dysplasia, which means that the acetabulum is a little bit shallow, uh, to frank dislocation, which means that the head of the femur is outside of the acetabulum. What are the risk factors for these conditions? Girls are more commonly affected than boys. It happens usually in the firstborn uh, kids because the, mm, in the, the mother uh, musculature are still tight and uh, it's usually associated with breach presentation and uh, family history. So the risk factors um, for this condition is firstborn uh, female breach with positive family history. So this is extremely important. So firstborn female breach with family history has the highest risk factor for DDH or dislocation. So how do we assess infants for uh, hip stability? There is two maneuvers that uh, we can do to assess the hip condition uh, in infants and this should be done for uh, all uh, uh, infants in their uh, neonatal period. First one is a Barlow test and the second one is Ortolani test. We are going to go uh, in details for each of these. So let's speak uh, in details about each of these two maneuvers. We'll start with the Ortolani test. Ortolani test to assess if the hip is dislocated or not. So keep in mind that Ortolani test, me, uh, you're going to assess if the hip is out or not. And one thing that you can um, use to remember is Ortolani starts with O and out starts with O. So if the hip is out, we're going to do the Ortolani test to see if we can bring that in or not. So in the Ortolani test, we would like to assess if the hip is dislocated or not. So how do we do this maneuver? We do the maneuver by holding the, mm, the child, uh, the infant uh, extremity in the hand. The thumb is on the medial aspect, the other three fingers on the lateral aspect. And then we bring the extremity outward or abduction. So we abduct the extremity or bring it outward. And then if the hip is out, it should come in. The positive result is clunk, not click. Click is a normal uh, finding, or we sometimes call it equivo equivocal um, finding. Um, but the, uh, to say that this uh, uh, infant has a positive ortolani, you need to feel clunk. Clunk you, uh, it's, uh, means that the whole um, hip is coming out and in. You will, f you will feel this maneuver, that you will feel that the hip is coming out and in of the socket, and it will be, there will be like a suction uh, feeling uh, when the hip comes out and in. So again, positive results mean clunk and not click. Hearing a clicking or feeling a clicking, that's uh, normal or equivocal uh, results. So again, Ortolani to detect if the hip is dislocated, uh, the extremity is hold in the finger, uh, in the palm with the thumb on the medial aspect, the outer three finger, uh, outer four fingers uh, on the lateral aspect, and then we abduct the extremity, it means we bring it outward, and if there is a positive result, you will feel the clunk. Please notice that you do only one side at a time, you don't do both sides in the same time. 
So positive result, as we said, it's clunk. It's not clicking. Clicking is normal or equivocal result. So the Ortolani test, as you see, the thumb is on the medial aspect, the outer four fingers on the lateral aspect, and then you bring the um, leg outward. And if there is a clunk, uh, that means that there is positive, which means that the hip was dislocated. And with this maneuver, you put it back into position. Now let's go to the Barlow test. Barlow test is the test to see if this head is subluxable or not, which means that you, you'd like to assess if this hip can be dislocated from the acetabulum. So the hip is in, but you'd like to see if you can bring it out or not. So this is form of subluxation. Um, so you're not doing a Barlow test to see if the hip is dislocated or not. You're doing to see if this hip is unstable or it can be dislocated if you push on it. So. Or to Lani test, you do it to see if the hip is out or not, or if the hip is dislocated or not. Barlow test, you see if you can dislocate a hip, or to see if the hip is subluxable. It means to, the hip is in, and you'd like to see if you can uh, push that hip out of position or not. Barlow test is you bring the you hold the child in the same position, so um, the, the the knee is in the palm the outer four fingers on the lateral aspect, the thumb is on the inner aspect, but in the Barlow maneuver, what you do is you bring the leg inward, which we call adduction, not abduction. So you bring the leg inward, adduction, and then you push backwards. So this is uh, the um, Barlow test. You, so you bar in the Barlow test, the, the, you're holding the extremity, uh, the same maneuver as Ortolani. Uh, the knee is in the palm. The outer four fingers are on the lateral aspect. Uh, the thumb is on the inner aspect. Uh, it differs from the Ortolani in the position that you put the leg in. So in this time, you're going to adduct, bring the limb uh, inward, and then push backwards. So DDH, again, uh, in summary, you hold the extremity, you do one side at a time, and uh, when you bring the leg outward or abduction, you're doing the uh, Ortolani maneuver to see if the hip is out of position or not, uh, or in other words, to see if the hip is dislocated or not. Uh, the Barlow maneuver, you bring the uh, leg inward and you press backward to see if you can uh, get the hip uh, out of position or not, which would what we call subluxable head. Now let's speak about ultrasound, which is very important in detecting uh, DDH. So remember that um, the ossific center of the femur appears between four and six months. So if you get an X-ray early in life, you won't know if the hip is in or not because basically the head of the femur is still cartilage and you won't be able to see anything if you get an X-ray. That's why we depend on the ultrasound in the early uh, uh, stage of life. So in the first few months, what we get is we get an ultrasound to see uh, the, uh, if the hip is in position or not. Uh, the view that we depend uh, most is the coronal flexion view. It means that we flex uh, the uh, child um, and, uh, hip and knee, and then we get uh, coronal pictures uh, for their hip. The coronal pictures looks very similar to getting an X-ray uh, in the AP position because basically you're getting a coronal cut in this uh, infant. So the transducer will be coming from here. The first thing that you will see is you will see your gluteus muscle, gluteus maximus, minimus, and medius, and then you will see the femoral head after that. Above that will be the iliac crest, and below that will be the ischialtubrosity, and in the middle will be the triradiate cartilage. So keep this x-ray in uh, your mind, and then we will see how this will be translating to an ultrasound in the coronal flexion view. So let's speak uh, now about uh, this picture. So keep in mind that picture. This is the picture that I just uh, showed you in the previous slide. It's an x-ray of the hip in the AP position. And this is the picture that we depend mostly uh, in the ultrasound to measure most of the uh, our angles, which is the coronal uh, fl uh, uh, flexion coronal view. So as you see here, you will have your AB doctors which are these uh, lines, the gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. And then you will see the femoral head here, which is uh, this round structure. And then the iliac crest is this dense white structure. Uh, the mm, uh, bony acetabulum is this part. 
the dark area is the triradiate cartilage which is non-ossified structure and then the ischium is this part so keep in mind this picture of the ultrasound um, as it will uh, show you um, how we are going to measure our angles now so this is the alpha angle which we depend mostly for uh, assessment of the acetabulum alpha angles uh, basically measures your bony acetabulum and uh, you'd like this to be a, a big angle because the bigger angle it is it means that the, the bony acetabulum is deep structure and most of the femoral head can sit inside that deep structure so alpha angle how do we measure the alpha angle we measure it by a line along the iliac bone which is this um, uh, uh, dense white structure so we draw a line along that um, uh, iliac uh, bone and then we draw another line uh, over the bony acetabulum which is the junction between the ilium and the bony acetabulum till the triradiate cartilage this will give us our alpha angle and uh, again you'd like the alpha angle to be more than 60 degree the higher alpha angle the better because it means that uh, you have a deep acetabulum and then most of the femoral head is sitting inside the acetabulum if this is a shallow uh, a alpha angle a small uh, angle uh, that means it's in a shallow acetabulum and that means that most of the femoral head will be outside we're going to see examples for this uh, in the next few slides uh, the next angle that we measure is the beta angle and the beta angle basically uh, measures your cartilaginous acetabulum and you'd like this to be small angles because bigger beta angles means that the femoral head is outside the uh, acetabulum and it's pushing the cartilaginous acetabulum outside. Uh, so the, how do we measure the uh, beta angle? Uh, uh, one line we used it before along the iliac crest. Uh, and the other line is along your cartilaginous acetabulum which is uh, the labrum part and uh, this line is from the junction of the uh, ilium with the cartilaginous acetabulum to the end of the cartilaginous acetabulum again um, big beta bad so remember big beta bad because it means that the femoral head is outside um, and it's pushing the cartilaginous acetabulum uh, up so let's see some examples here so this is a coronal flexion view here's your gluteus uh, gluteus maximus medius minimus and then this is your femoral head here and this is your iliac crest um, and we draw a line along the iliac crest if you draw a line along the iliac crest and most of your femoral head as in this case is in the acetabulum which is this part so here is the acetabulum here is the triradiate cartilage here is the ischium so if you see most of the femoral head is inside the acetabulum so we draw a line this line is a, a, a line that we draw along the iliac bone and you find that most of the femoral head lying inside the bony acetabulum here and that means that this head is in uh, the acetabulum and it's not dislocated let's measure the angles now so this is the first line that we use the line along the iliac crest and this is the line between the junction of the bony acetabulum with the iliac crest to the uh, triradiate cartilage you will see that the alpha angle here is 62 that means it's a deep angle it's a deep acetabulum it's more than 60 degree that means that the acetabulum is deep and most of the femoral head can lie into this space if you see the beta angle here which is the uh, cartilaginous acetabulum one line across the iliac crest the other line is here uh, along the cartilaginous acetabulum uh, and this angle here is a, sh a small angle 35 remember big beta bad if it's more than 55 that uh, that's not good that means that most of the femoral head had gone outside the bony acetabulum and is pushing uh, that labrum outside but if it's a small degree that like this one 35 less than 55 it means that most of the femoral head lies in the acetabulum in the bony part and that uh, the cartilaginous acetabulum uh, is not pushed outward let's see another example here so again these are the gluteus muscles and this is the femoral head let's now draw a line which is this line uh, across the iliac bone you will find that most of the femoral head lies outside the acetabulum so do you see this picture most of your femoral head which is this the this structure lies outside the acetabulum in the previous uh, uh, slide we saw that most of the femoral head was here 
Here in this picture, most of the femoral head lies uh, 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 outside a line across the iliac crest. So this is the iliac crest. This is the line that we drew, and we found that most of the femoral head is outside the bony acetabulum. So let's measure now our angle. This uh, We have one line drawn already, the other line from the junction uh, of this line with the bony acetabulum to the triradiate cartilage, and it's a small angle, 45. That means it's a shallow acetabulum, and most of the femoral head has to lie outside. When the femoral head lies outside, it pushes the, la the labrum and the cartilaginous acetabulum outside, uh, and you will have a big beta angle, which is not good. Now let's see this example. This is the um, uh, iliac crest here. We draw a line across the iliac crest. This is the line that we draw. And in this case, it's not most of the uh, femur is outside. It's the whole femur is outside. So here is the iliac crest. Here is the uh, bony acetabulum. Here is the triradiate cartilage. And if you see, the whole femoral head is outside the bony acetabulum. These are the gluteae. So it's not that part of it it's, uh, is outside or most of it is outside. It's the whole uh, m uh, head is outside. That's frank dislocation. That's what I said in the beginning of this lecture. Uh, DDH is a spectrum of a disease. It can range from subluxation or mild dysplasia to frank dislocation. So the whole femoral head here is outside. Let's measure the angle. Alpha angle is very small. It's only 30 degree, which means it's very shallow acetabulum. The femoral head is outside. And if you see the cartilaginous acetabulum had been pushed uh, by the head and the angle is big now, it's 85 degrees. This is uh, what uh, uh, most centers now do for their ultrasound. They call dynamic ultrasound. It means that they take pictures for the femoral head with different position. So this is the same patient with the two different positions. This is with the extremity uh, uh, adducted, which means that the extremity is uh, um, uh, brought uh, towards the midline. And this is with the extremity abducted, which means the extremity has uh, been pushed uh, away from the midline. So here is the gluteal muscles again. Here is the femoral head. Here is the iliac bone. Here is your alpha. Uh, uh, here is your alpha angle, a line between the, uh, over the bony acetabulum and the iliac crest. Here is your triradiate. Here is your cartilaginous acetabulum. So if you see the, with the hip in the adducted position, whereas the hip is brought in towards the midline, most of the femoral head lies outside. Uh, however, when the hip is abducted the femoral most of the femoral head now will lie inside the joint so or half of it will lie in the lie inside the joint so that means that this patient has some dysplasia uh, with position um posi with with bringing the f uh, the leg uh, inward uh, the head uh, can subluxate uh, but when we bring the uh, leg outward the head comes back into position so uh, that's a uh, dysplasia with uh, subluxation uh, again, this is another picture here to show you. So this, these are the gluteal muscles. Here is the femoral head. If you see the femoral head lies outside the acetabulum, if you draw a line uh, across here, the bone, the uh, iliac bone, you'll find uh, the whole femoral head lies outside this line. This is the triradiate cartilage. This is your alpha angle, very shallow angle. And if you see the acetabulum here is empty and your femoral head lies outside the acetabulum. Now, after we discussed how we do the Ortolani and Barlow, and we discussed uh, how we do the ultrasound, let's see what is the recommendation for the American Academy of Pediatricians for the hip assessment of DDH. Remember, DDH is a, a common disease, uh, and uh, it is not detectable except with a screening. So you need to keep that in mind. It's a common condition, and you have to screen for it. You have to look for it. So how frequent to do that? How, when do you send for ultrasound? When do you send for x-rays? All these um, they can be answered by the recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrician that I'm going to summarize it uh, for you now. So let's start one by one. So all newborns should be screened by physical exam. So every newborn, every and each newborn should be examined um, uh, by Barlow and Ortolani test uh, when he is in the nursery. This is extremely important. So every newborn has to be examined for DDH by Barlow and Ortolani. 
do we have to do ultrasound for every kid? This is common in Europe in certain countries like uh, Austria and Germany, uh, but here in the U.S., this is not uh, the recommendation. So um, if you're asked, do you do routine ultrasound for every uh, newborn? The answer in the U.S. is no. Uh, but keep in mind that certain countries uh, in Europe uh, do that. Next point is, um, what if you have a clunk? If you have a positive ortolani or positive pardo? It's not a click. You have a clunk uh, when you do the ortolani or parlo. That means that this is a positive result, okay? So if you get a positive parlo or ortolani, what you do is you do orthopedic referral. You do not need to do an ultrasound or radiograph um, because you had a positive result. So the ultrasound uh, or the radiograph, if it's more than four months, will not add anything to you. So um, this is very important uh, thing. If you have a positive clunk, you don't get an ultrasound. You send for orthopedic uh, directly. Uh, don't use the triple diaper uh, in this condition because it may delay more appropriate treatment. If you're suspecting uh, mild dysplasia, you can try to use tri uh, triple diapers. Uh, but if you have a positive result, if you have positive Barlu or positive Ortolani, what you do is you do orthopedic referral, and then the orthopedic surgeon is going to apply a public harness. You don't apply a diaper, triple diaper, if you uh, have positive result. So again, positive result, you do orthopedic referral, you don't do ultrasound, and you don't do double or triple diapers. You send for orthopedic uh, surgeon, and the orthopedic surgeon is going to apply the public harness, as we're going to see later. What if you have equivocal result? Equivocal result, you have a soft click. You don't have a clunk. You don't have that feeling of the hip is coming out and in of the joint, that suction, uh, that sensation that the whole hip is coming out and in. All what you have is a click. And remember, click is, uh, in most of the case, is a normal finding. So we call that equivocal. If you have an equivocal finding with the exam that you did for that newborn, you repeat the exam after two weeks. So you repeat the exam after two weeks, uh, and what are you going to do if uh, after two weeks? If the results are the same, soft click, you can do ultrasound or you do orthopedic referral. If the results become negative, this is a normal kid. You don't have to do anything. If the results became positive, which means you have now a clunk, you do orthopedic referral. So let's summarize our uh, this slide. So every newborn has to be examined by Barlow and Ortolani. You do not have to do ultrasound for every newborn. If you do the mm, a test when the child is born and it's positive, what you do is orthopedic referral. You don't do ultrasound or triple diaper. If it's positive, orthopedic referral. If it's equivocal, it means soft click, you repeat it after two weeks. And then after two weeks, if it's still positive, if, if it becomes positive, you go for orthopedic referral. If it um, stay the same, which is click, either orthopedic referral or ultrasound. If it becomes negative, this is a normal kid and you don't have to do anything else. Let's continue now the recommendations. Now you have to keep the risk factors in, uh, in mind. What were the risk factors? As I told you, risk factor is firstborn female breach with positive family history. Firstborn female uh, uh, breach with positive family history. So uh, the American Academy of Pediatrician is asking us to keep the risk factor in mind. So if the results of a newborn are negative or equivocal positive, it means that there is a click, keep the risk factors in mind. If it's positive, orthopedic referral, and you're, going not, you're not going to do ultrasound and you're not going to be triple diaper. If it's negative or equivocal, keep the risk factors in mind. If it's a female, repeat it after two weeks. So if it's just a female, normal uh, a newborn a female, you have to repeat that hip exam after two weeks what uh, if it's a positive uh, family history for ddh or breach so if you have a kid with a positive family history of ddh or breach presentation if it's a boy evaluate after two weeks so if you have a boy with positive family hi uh, history of, or a boy with breach presentation all what you have to do is repeat the exam after two weeks but if it's a female, I would recommend that you, or the American Academy is recommending you get an ultrasound. So ultrasound at the age of six weeks. You don't get it at the age of one, two, or three weeks because you will have high false uh, positive result. Um, or you can wait till they are at the age of four months and get uh, an uh, x-ray. I would prefer that you get the ultrasound at the age of six
weeks. So again, if you have a negative or equivocal result in a female with breach or DDH, get an ultrasound. So again, negative or click in a female with breach or DDH, get an ultrasound at the age of six weeks or x-ray at the age of four months. And um, one, if you're uh, worried, you can get an x-ray for all breech uh, uh, newborn, either boys or girls at the age of four months for detection of acetabular development. This is not um, a strict uh, recommendation. You can consider that, but you don't have to do this, which is getting a radiograph for all um, uh, breech uh, uh, newborns at the age of four months for acetabular development. I would recommend for you to just to keep this this second point into mind. So if you get a female with a breach or a female with a hist family history of DDH, get an ultrasound at the age of six weeks. So to summarize this slide, I would tell you female with DDH, female with breach, even if it's negative, get an ultrasound at the age of six weeks. Let's now continue the recommendation of the American Academy for Pediatrician for the assessment of the hip and DDH, which for the periodicity. The hips must be examined in every will baby visit. So keep examining the hips. You don't want to miss any DDH in your career. So each time you get the, uh, an infant for a will baby visit, get a hip exam. If the DDH is suspected by abnormal exam or uh, the parents will complain of difficult change of diaper. Why is that? Because they cannot abduct, they cannot bring the leg outward, so they cannot uh, easily change the diaper. So if they complain of that in any visit, do one of the following. Repeat the exam focused while the child is relaxed, or you can do orthopedic referral or do imaging studies. The imaging study depends on the age. Less than four years, get an ultrasound. Older than four years, get an X, uh, I'm sorry, less than four months, get an ultrasound. Older than four months, get an X-ray. So the hip is examined in each visit. If you suspect DDH with abnormal exam or the parents are complaining of difficulty in changing diaper because they cannot abduct the extremity, uh, do orthopedic referral, do a focus exam if the child is relaxed or do imaging study. I would recommend that you do the second or the third one. Get an imaging study or refer to orthopedic. Now we're uh, done from the neonatal period and now let's speak about DDH in toddlers or children. So let's uh, say that this child was missed or this is an adopted child uh, coming from abroad and then now you'd like to uh, see if this child has a DDH or not. The thing that uh, most obvious is shortening of the femur, which we call Galeazzi sign. How do you do that? We flex the hip and we flex the knees. And then you come from the uh, lower end of the child and you see, you uh, examine. So this is a case of a nine month, uh, I'm sorry, one and a half year old uh, girl uh, uh, that um, uh, just came from uh, another country and uh, mm, uh, she was referred for me for limb length discrepancy. If you do the Galeazzi test by flexing the hips, flexing the knees, and then you uh, stand at the uh, bottom of the bed looking to the child, you will find one limb. This, do you see this knee is longer than this knee? If you draw a line here, this uh, uh, lower extremity is longer than this lower extremity. Why? Because this side is dislocated. So um, the hip has went upward, so the whole extremity is shorter. So if you flex the hips, flex the knees, and then look from the bottom of the bed, you will see that one side is longer than the other. This is called Galeazzi sign. One of the things that we can uh, 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 see sometimes is unequal gluteal fold, but I would like to caution you that this sometimes is a normal finding and you do not have to uh, refer each uh, kid with unequal gluteal fold. Limited abduction is very important. Do you see this is, this is a nine month uh, old girl that has been referred to me. It was Miss DDH when she was um, young. If you see, I can here abduct the right side to um, about 90 degree. On the left side, I cannot. It's only 60 degree. So here I'm abducting 90 degree. Here it's only 60 degree. Something wrong in this hip. Get an X-ray. Now it's nine months. You get an X-ray. You will find the hip is out. So shortening, unequal gluteal fold, and limited abduction. If this child now starts being 15 month, 18 month, and he start walking, you will notice the limping for unilateral case or waddling gear for bilateral cases. 
So shortening, unequal gluteal fold, limited abduction, and limping. However, keep in mind, pain is never a symptom of untreated DDH. So if a child does, is not treated from DDH, he will never have pain. Uh, he will have a pain when he develops arthritis, which is usually by the fourth or the fifth decade of life. But if he is um, still uh, in his childhood, he will not have pain. He can have shortening, unequal gluteal fold, limited abduction, limping, but not pain. So now we after we discuss the ultrasound pictures in details for the DDH, let's uh, describe the X-ray finding for cases of missed DDH. So this is uh, the nine-month-old uh, boy uh, girl that I uh, showed uh, uh, the picture. Um, if we get an X-ray for her uh, for the pelvis, we will see the following. So if you see this is the right side, you have a, a good size ossific uh, nucleus here for the proximal femur. If you draw these two lines, these two lines are a line um, horizontal at the, between the two um, uh, between the two uh, triradiate cartilage. So here is the triradiate cartilage, which is the unossified area in the acetabulum. Here is the triradiate cartilage, which is the unossified area of this acetabulum. You draw a line between them. That's called the Helgenreiner line. So the Helgenreiner line connects between the two um, uh, unossified part of the acetabulum which is the uh, the triradiate cartilage remember horizontal line helgenreiner both starts with h horizontal line helgenreiner line and now you draw this line which is the perkin line so the perkin line is a 90 degree angle uh, over the helgenreiner line at the level of the outer edge of your acetabulum so here's your acetabulum, here's your outer edge. You draw a line perpendicular to the Helgenreiner, it's called Perkins. So Perkins, perpendicular, both starts with P. Helgenreiner, horizontal, both starts with H. Perkins, perpendicular, both starts with P. Helgenreiner, horizontal line between the two triradiate cartilage. Perkins is a perpendicular line over the Helgenreiner line at the level of the outer part of your acetabulum. So ossific center here lies in the infro, so these two lines will make four quadrants. The ossific center here is in the infro medial quadrant. So Perkins, Helgenreiner, Perkins at the level of the outer edge of the uh, uh, acetabulum. The ossific center here lies in the infro medial quadrant. So infralateral, uh, suprolateral, supromedial, infralateral, infromedial. So the ossific center for the normal hip should lies in that quadrant, in the infromedial quadrant of the four uh, quadrants that are made by the uh, intersection between the Helgenreiner and Perkins. Helgenreiner horizontal, Perkins perpendicular to that at the level of the outer crest will give you four quadrants, Su supromedial, suprolateral, infralateral infromedial normally the ossific center should buy, should be in the infromedial let's see this left side which is the dislocated side again helgenreiner perkins these are the four quadrant you see the ossific center here two things smaller than this side and it's in the suprolateral so if it's dislocated it will be in the suprolateral normally it's in the infromedial so it's the suprolateral quadrant smaller so two things that we see in the ossific center, it is outside and outer ward, so that it will be a suprolateral quadrant of these two lines, and it will be smaller. Other thing that you can see here is what we call Shinton line. Shinton line is an imaginary line. If you go along the superior border uh, of your obturator foramen, which is the inferior border of the uh, bubic bone, and you draw you continue this line it will be it will come along the inferior border of the femoral neck it will be like a continuous circle here or semicircle let's draw the same here it will be broken so if you draw here it does not come in the same line so this part and this part are no longer forming a semicircle so if you see here it's a very uh, homogeneous semicircle it's called Shinton's line. Here, it does not. So these parts are separate. It's called broken Shinton line. So broken Shinton line, 
the, the, the uh, civic center is in the supralateral and it is small. Now, let's speak about treatment. So we discussed the pathology, we discussed the, uh, how do we do the uh, screening and what is the recommendation for screening. We discussed the clinical pictures uh, in the neonatal period, which is by screening, and then we discussed the clinical pictures in the toddler and children. Let's speak about now treatment of DDH. So if you detect that uh, child while uh, he's still newborn or very early in the first few months, you do orthopedic referral and they will apply the public harness. So orthopedic referral for public harness. Here is the public harness. Let's speak now about uh, how do you apply the public harness. This is very important because the orthopedic surgeon is going to apply it and then the mom has to take it off to give that child a shower or for change his diaper and she needs to put it back again. She will come to you to ask you how to put that public harness. So you need to know how to apply the public harness. So this is the public harness and how it works. It works by keeping the hip flexed and abducted. So if the hip is flexed and, abdu and abducted, it means the hip is outward and flexed that will put the femoral head into a better position to uh, rest in the acetabulum. So let's discuss the public harness now in detail. If you see, this is the mm, uh, strap that goes over the chest and this has to be at the level of the nipple. So instruct the mom, this has to be at the level of the nipple. So how do you adjust that? We adjust that with uh, these two straps. So these two straps adjust that um, uh, strap around the chest and this has to be at the level of the nipple. Now let's speak about the two important straps. One will be anterior and one will be posterior. So there is one posterior here that we don't see. It comes posterior to the uh, uh, thigh and one anterior here that we see. This will control your hip position. So again, this has to be at the level of the nipple. You control it with this and then the uh, feet are into this uh, steer ups uh, which are controls by velcro you have two straps that you have to control this one which is in uh, medial or in front of the thigh and another one which is behind the thigh so this one basically it controls the hip flexion so this one which is anterior to the hip it controls the hip flexion you'd like to keep the hip flexion are between 90 and 100 you don't want to too much flex the hip because you will cause some uh, uh, compression over the femoral nerve and you don't want to extend the hip because that will be uh, an unstable position so you'd like to keep it between 90 and 100 if you see in this picture so the hip is about 95 degree flexed compared to the trunk and the flexion is controlled again by these two straps which is anterior or medial to the thigh there is two straps which is similar to this one posterior or lateral to the thigh and these control abduction you don't want to put the child in maximally abducted position you'd like to adjust these posterior straps that you don't see in this picture so that maximally these uh, two um, extremity can come about a thing, uh, hand breadth or uh, uh, four finger breadth between each other so uh, you would like to adjust them so if the child can uh, can bring uh, the two knees together it will be at least one uh, finger uh, one hand breadth so mm, you don't want to uh, make it too tight that it will that the child will always be abducted and you do uh, in the same time you don't want to make it too loose that he can bring the knees together so you'd like to make it so that if he bring the knees together it will be at least one hand breadth uh, again, don't put it too much uh, tight because if the child is always abducted, that can affect the blood supply to the femoral head. The public harness had to be applied for 23 hours a day. So basically, you tell the mom to take it off only when you're giving the child a shower or changing his clothes. And it's applied for the age of application last two months. So if you detect the, uh, the DDH at the age of one month, it's applied for uh, three months, which is the age of application, which is at one month plus two months. Now, let's say that uh, you detected that um, condition now uh, after, uh, six uh, after six months. Most probably, I would say even after four months, it is very hard to reduce the hips with public harness. So you will have to go to the second form of treatment, which is arthrogram and close reduction with a spike cast. So again, if you detect it in the first four months, you're lucky, you put him in public harness. In most cases, it will improve and the child will be cured. 
uh, if you don't detect it um, in the first four to six months, um, the, the orthopedic surgeon in most cases will do the arthrogram, close reduction, and hip spike. It means that we put the child to sleep, we inject a dye in the hip because uh, um, you, ha you can see a small part of the ossific neoclus, but you cannot see the whole head. So we inject the dye, the dye will show us the femoral head. If you see here, the dye will give you the femoral head. It will show you the, uh, also the capsule, the extension of the capsules. And then you see that uh, you reduce the uh, hip and if when you reduce it, you will be able to see it better because the dye will show you exactly where is the hip and then you apply a spica cast. Usually we apply the spica cast for six weeks and then we bring the child back to the OR, we inject uh, the dye again um, and do another exam, make sure it's stable and apply the spica for another six weeks. So first four to six months, that treatment, orthopedic referral for public harness, after six months, um, the treatment is, in most cases, is uh, arthrogram, close reduction, and spica application. What if you detected now after 18 months? So um, if you detected after 18 months, uh, in most cases, you won't be able to reduce it uh, with close reduction. And in most cases, you will need to do an open reduction. So you will need to do an open reduction. So the uh, orthopedic surgeon will bring the child to the OR, um, uh, open the soft tissues, reduce the hip, and put the child in a spica cast. Uh, sometimes e we even have to add femoral osteotomy or, uh, or pelvic osteotomy to make the reduction more stable or to decrease the stresses on the femoral head to avoid the development of avascular necrosis. Uh, remember, any form of treatment of DDH can affect the blood supply, even the public harness. So uh, when you treat DDH, you're taking some risk of, of getting uh, uh, mm, uh, affection of the blood supply. Of course, that affection is more with open reduction than close reduction, and more with close reduction than just the, sp the, the public harness. The public harness risk is minimal. The close reduction uh, is um, more, but still small uh, percentage. However, when you start doing open reduction for these cases, uh, there is a higher risk for getting uh, affection of the blood supply to the femoral head and developing avascular necrosis. Once the child develops avascular necrosis, he will have pain. I'd like to thank you for um, uh, listening to this lecture. Thank you.